Hi, this is a quick response to an account of your video Antinatalism and Depression 55, I think that is LV, Benatar's graph in which you're talking about, um, you refer to it as an asymmetry, but it's not a Benatarian asymmetry, so I won't use that term. But you're talking about the fact that Benatar and others who are in this discussion tend not to focus on positives, they tend to focus only on negatives. Uh, what you call the lower half of the graph, the bit below the default position, uh, negative states of being, pains, discomforts, those kind of things. And you say, well, they're just missing half of it out. I left a comment, but um, I just thought I'd flesh that out because there is a reason for that, kind of moral, historical reason for why Benatar does that, which I think is just worth kicking around for a bit. I mean, my understanding, at least, is that he's, he's really drawing on um, a tradition of consequentialist ethics, particularly negative utilitarianism. Just to make sure we're singing from the same hymn book. Consequentialism is a, a moral philosophical principle which explains how, how we can judge certain actions to be good. A good action is judged if it produces good consequences. Uh, a bad action is bad because it produces bad consequences. If I get a sharp object, I get a, a sharp object like this pen knife, and I thrust it into someone's chest, that's a bad action because it produces bad consequences. Yes, they get they feel pain, they might even um, die as a result of that, causing all kinds of anguish. So the, the moral value of my action, it's judged as negative because it has negative consequences. And similarly, uh, a positive action, if I give them a cream cake, that's a positive action because it has positive consequences, it nourishes them, it gives them a sugar high, all those kind of things. I know that's really obvious, but it's just consequentialist ethics. It's always amazing to me that, because of course it's such a bedrock of everything we think, you know, that, that actions are judged by their results, that um, it, it's kind of amazing, isn't it, that some people have to kind of had to think about this. But I guess it's it's just that they wrote it down and formulated it, isn't it? Anyway, that, that, that tradition of consequentialist ethics, which in most recent times comes through people like John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham, uh, it's, it's very successful. It does produce problems though, uh, and with one of the key problems being what happens when you offset positives against negatives? What happens when you include both positives and negatives in your evaluation of, a, of an action? And that, unfortunately, if you, if you run certain simulations through that, that leads to moral absurdities, or it leads to actions which, uh, which according to the calculation, the consequentialist calculation, would be positive, but which we kind of feel just aren't. And so there's clearly a problem. The most obvious one of that, the one that's usually cited, is uh, the gang rape argument. You have to imagine one person, one guy, for example, is gang raped by 20 other men and suffers horribly as a result. But of course, those 20 men may have had a great time. They may have really, really enjoyed themselves, you know, with no feelings of guilt afterwards, because that's the kind of guys they are. Uh, in a classic kind of consequentialist argument, that action, that, that whole situation would have a morally positive value because 20 people have, have, posit have had beneficial positive experiences, one person's had a negative, the benefits outweigh the, uh, the negative consequences, therefore it's moral. But we, we all know that's not right. So there must be something wrong with a classic kind of consequentialist argument, yes? So we have to revisit that and think, well, how do we get around that? And um, the way that's usually resolved is through um, Karl Popper's negative utility. And another example, by the way, which I'll, I'll just bring up is a, a, just a thought experiment, is um, if you've got two people in a room, right? One person who is suffering and one person who is not, and you have the opportunity to either relieve that person's suffering or elevate that person who isn't suffering into a state of pleasure, which would we do? Now again, according to a standard consequentialist model, there's no difference. Your, the sum total of human suffering, the sum total of human pleasure is the same if you lower one or raise the other. But our intuitions tell us, our common moral sense tells us that that's not right. That the right thing to do is to lower the person's suffering. Yes, the person who's suffering has to be dealt with first before you can raise anybody else's. So, Again, that's, that's telling us there's, there's something wrong with the standard consequentialist model. And so Popper develops the uh, negative utility argument, which basically says that when you're doing those kind of calculations, you don't count the positives, you only count the negatives. 
the important question, to paraphrase Jeremy Bentham, is uh, do they suffer? So you'd look at the suffering first. So with the example of the two people in a room, one of whom is suffering, one of whom is not, there's no question about what the right thing to do is because you, you, you're not interested in, the, in elevating a person's pleasure levels. You're only looking at suffering and, you, and the right moral action to do would be to, to, to decrease that level of suffering and that accords perfectly with our moral sense. We, we kind of know that to be true. So to have that as a moral um, precept makes sense to us, yeah? So that's the negative utility. Now, one of the arguments that was lodged against the negative utility was Smart's uh, pinprick argument, as he called it, the pinprick argument, which basically says that if you're not counting the positives and you're only counting the negatives, then the smallest negative, um, the smallest amount of suffering, is enough to, to make the whole system invalid. Now, this, and this is essentially the argument which antinatalism pursues. Because if you don't count the positives, if you only count the negatives, which that his particular history of philosophy suggests you have to do, if you're only counting the negatives, then the smallest amount of suffering, the smallest amount of negative input, is um, weights the whole system down to the negative, even such as as small as a pinprick, as Smart says. And that's 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 the um, now. When, well, I should say, by the way, that when Smart devised that, he he kind of devised it as a kind of reduction to absurdity of Popper, saying, "Look, Popper, this negative utility thing must be crap because look, it suggests that life isn't worth living, even if you just get a pinprick, just pricking yourself with a pin is." such a morally indefensible act that, you, that there's no point in being alive. And he, as I say, he's trying to use that as a reductio ad absurdam, but Benatar takes that seriously and runs with that. It isn't, it isn't pseudo-philosophy, I don't think. He's, he's, he's just taking that serious, fairly seriously and, and, and doing the moral... plumbing what happens morally if you do that. And it does lead to that kind of conclusion. Now, I think there's two ways of looking at that. You can look at it either as as... Um, well, actually, in the way that Benatar doesn't, because Benatar finishes his book by saying that he doesn't, he would not support any kind of legislation or or action, political action, activism, in support of which followed his ideas. He's just exploring the ideas. Um, it, it, it came to a point of believing them himself, but he absolutely doesn't think that those ideas should be enshrined in any kind of legislation. Um, but he is just exploring the, that as a philosophical idea. Uh, so, so one res response is to share with ben Benatar's opinion that, oh, yes, it has some validity, albeit with Benatar, not strong enough validity to, act to actually warrant action in the world, but just perhaps uh, enough viability to, to warrant you know, changing one's own behaviour. Or the alternative is to, is to stay with smart and see, see this as a, a reduction to absurdity. It's that kind of philosophy, negative utility of that order, does lead to the kind of conclusions where anything as, such, as simple as a pinprick would um, you know, kind of obviate the necessity to, to withhold procreation because, that, because any negative since negatives are all accounting, any negative at all, no matter how small, is enough to tip the balance in the direction of, you know, not furthering uh, life or not producing life. So that is my <laughs> understanding of the argument. Sorry, I took a little bit longer. Not I didn't. This is going to be talking for nine minutes, but that's my that's my understanding of that. So you know, but, but the question there for me is: Is Benatar extending Smart's uh, reduction to absurdity? Or is it taking that thing seriously and extending Popper's negative utility into um, and plumbing the actual real-world consequences of that? Thank you.